Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be joined by President Clever Caroni of the Inter American Development Bank to discuss how the IDB is upping its response to climate change, the critical moment facing Latin America and the Caribbean as COP26 approaches, and the opportunity to drive more investments into climate action and a green recovery from the pandemic, including through nature-based solutions. This conversation is a part of the launch event for a new research from IDB and WRI entitled Nature-Based Solutions in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's been an absolute pleasure to collaborate with IDB. For those of you who might not know, nature-based solutions are strategies that enhance the health of nature to achieve tangible development outcomes. Investment in nature solutions, or NBS to be short, offer three kinds of benefits. They can help countries improve infrastructure delivery, avoid losses from climate impact, saving countries billions of dollars each year. For example, wetlands and forests can absorb and filter flood water, which helps to protect downstream communities, maintain water supply, and avoid damages to buildings and roads. Nature-based solutions can also generate direct economic gains through jobs in tourism, increased productivity of food, fish, timber, and most importantly, they can deliver other benefits from cleaner air to protection of biodiversity. And critically, NBS can provide one third, I repeat, one third of the climate mitigation needed between now and 2030 to keep global warming below uh, two degrees Celsius. This win-win solution have been around for decades, but especially it gained real traction since the Climate Action Summit of 20. 19. Nature-based solutions is now a core theme in climate action worldwide, and it's a really a priority for um, Glasgow COP26. In fact, some people are calling this the nature COP. The COP is uh, setting aside November 6th as a nature day and have a session in the first two days is 150 heads of states will gather, and they're setting us on three hours of discussion just on nature. These are all very good signs. So, President Plevakaran, this is a absolute pleasure to be here with you. How are you? And it's been a pleasure to collaborate with you. Th thank you so much, Annie. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks for World Resources Institute. And, and hey, it's been a, a, a mutual uh, pleasure here working with you as well. Thank you, Mauricio. Mauricio, Latin American Caribbean region is one of the world's regions that is most affected by impact of climate change. However, the region also has much to gain from aggressively addressing the issue today as part of the green economic transition, something that you focused on. How would you describe the challenge and most importantly, the opportunity for the region? Yeah. Hey, look, I think you mentioned it before. We have great momentum here. And, and like I said, this is part of, you know, the enthusiasm that we have and the mutual enthusiasm we have, the joint work that we're doing to consider really what climate change means for the future of Latin America and the Caribbean. And, and, and look, yes, and you said it, that's in terms of both the vulnerabilities, obviously, which we're all familiar with, but also, and, and you hinted towards it, the tremendous potential that our region can realize with the right green policies going forward. Our role as the region's leading development bank is to really help our 26 borrowing members mitigate, adapt to the risk, and really help seize what we see as a once-in-a-generation opportunity that's been presented by the pandemic to really, ironically, to rebuild sustainability. And that means really looking at a holistic approach, focused on creating benefits, both in terms of healthier climate and new opportunities for both green jobs and growth, because it's not a zero-sum game. Green jobs create growth. And you asked me how I describe this challenge. And look, our region is at a historic crossroads, and that's going to force countries to look at climate through a zero-sum winners and losers lens. The point here is that there's not going to be any losers here when we talk about climate. We can all win if we see and pursue the opportunities. Our reality is that the pandemic hit our region harder than any other, with the highest per capita death toll in the world, the worst GDP contraction in two centuries, and that's the presidency I walked into at the IDB in the region. But look, like the pandemic, climate change is presenting challenges daily to our region as well. So in addition to all of that, we see eight of our countries have been ranked amongst the world's top 10 most at risk to climate change. So add that uh, to the challenges. So we've already seen some of the warmest temperatures on record last year. And this year, we already had a record-breaking uh, Atlantic hurricane uh, season. Parts of the Amazon region and in the Pantanal, the, we've seen droughts. Uh, 
uh, which are affecting the economy of Brazil. It's affecting uh, supply there, and it's been the worst in six decades, which is another record year uh, in addition to forest fires that we're seeing there. Now, these impacts have significant economic costs. We estimate that unless global warming is limited to less than two degrees Celsius, our region is going to suffer damage from climate impact that's going to reach $100 billion annually by 2050. So you ask, what do warmer temperatures, more fire, stronger storms in Latin America and the Caribbean mean beyond our borders? And that's going to mean beyond our borders, pricier commodities, uh, packed shipping routes, uh, destruction of crops. And that's going to lead to tens of millions of people seeking migration to migrate from all throughout the Americas in the coming decades, and mainly due to food insecurity. So the push to green economies worldwide is going to be linked to our region as well. And remember, you know, one example is, is our region, and this is a great opportunity, our region has large quantities of lithium, rare earth elements that we're going to need uh, to sustainably source to make batteries for electric vehicles, wind turbines, solar power panels, uh, et cetera. And now, unlike the pandemic, you know, the difference here is that there's no vaccine for climate change. So it's really a matter of priorities, commitment, bold mitigation, adaptation, uh, uh, investments that we got to follow through on. So it's really a matter of deciding whether to invest in or innovate for and innovate for uh, our future in this regards. Now, public budgets, we are seeing them throughout the region. They're extremely tight, uh, particularly after all the anti-cyclical measures in response to COVID-19. But it's also a fact and not recognized enough that climate action is highly compatible with economic growth. When I first joined the IDB a year ago, my first priority was to work with our experts to design a blueprint for strategic investment that's going to accelerate recovery, sustainable, inclusive, long-term growth, and do so with a plan that break down barriers. And that's the result that we saw with our Vision 2025 strategy, which we launched at the annual meeting in Barranquilla in March. And it prioritizes bold action on climate change as one of the five pillars, the central pillars here. But that also focuses on integration, strength and value chains, digitalization, support for small businesses, gender equality, all of which together are linked to a sustainable future. We think here, we, think we, here see, we see, well, got an echo there. We see with the right, we, we believe that with the right fiscal policies, decarbonization of our region's economies are gonna create 15 million net, net new jobs by 2030 in areas like plant-based food production, renewable energy, construction, manufacturing, et cetera. And every dollar that we see invested in making infrastructure and economies more resilient are, can generate up to $4 in economic benefits. So look, the evidence is overwhelming, it's clear, Climate action is business friendly. Let me give you an example. Costa Rica. There we're supporting the National Decarbonization Plan, achieving net zero emissions. And we believe that's going to yield 40 billion plus dollars in net benefits within three decades through savings in energy, improvements in ecosystem services, agricultural yields. Let me give you a larger economy, Peru. That achievement could bring $140 billion in net benefits across sectors. So as we head into COP26, we're working in a wide variety of ways, more ambition, more innovation, more partners than ever, like uh, WRI to really unlock critical climate finance and drive sustainable recovery for our region and our people need. Marisha, I really like the big examples you used. Our audience would really connect what you're saying to outcome. Let's just, uh, I just want to go um, in two weeks, a more, little more than two weeks, the world leaders will gather in, in Glasgow and COP. Um, you will be there. This is a very important moment for the world, for the leaders to come. To be honest, the intervention to date has not really come up to 1.5 degrees or less than 2 degrees. What is at stake for Latin American Caribbean in this meeting, for this region? You know, IDB is defining itself as a leader, the innovator of this area. So what is the role that is, you know, in this, your role here in the crucial moment for Global Focus when the world is coming together? Yeah. Hey, look. First and foremost, I'm really looking forward to being there at COP26, and I can tell you that the, that the way the COPs organized the region have usually been characterized by the power of multilateralism and how it's applied towards a common goal. And we hope that that same spirit will very much be present in Glasgow, so that we can really broker just an ambitious agreement to keep that 1.5 degrees alive. And I'm I'm a, I'm you know I'm a defiant optimist, right? Like you can, that's that's my energy. That's who I am. Let me say here that by the end of 2021, at least 75% of our regional member countries will have presented their updated nationally determined contributions, in many cases with IDB support, and we're proud of that. In terms of concrete results, our countries that can hope for uh, in Glasgow, one would be progress in the definition of the guidelines for carbon markets. And we're looking there to work with our members to build governance, transparency pillars for carbon credits, for example. 
Our countries are also going to be in need of more finance, technology transfers to really help them build resilience in the face of worsening climate impacts. And I mentioned before that action on climate change is in our vision 2025. It's enshrined in it, in, in, in there. And indeed, we aim to be and we will be the main partner for Latin America and the Caribbean in reaping the development benefit of climate positive recovery from this pandemic and moving forward. So we're going to advance in Glasgow this agenda in several ways. And you're going to be you're going to i'm not going to give them to you right here but get ready for some big announcements that we're going to make there so alongside with our executive team i'm going to be there we're going to underscore and i'll give you just kind of a highlight of, of, of where we're going to be heading uh that we're going to be practicing what we preach to date the idb group has committed to a floor of 30 percent climate financing between 2020 and 2023 23, ensuring some five billion dollars in annual support to climate action and we're going to be looking to go even further on the road ahead We've also committed to assessing disaster and climate risk in 100% of our operations by 2023. And in line with the global commitment to limit the rise in temperature to well below two degrees Celsius and to avoid the point of no return, we started the process of aligning our own operations here at the Bank to Paris Agreement objectives. At our annual meeting in Barranquilla last March, the IDB member countries requested our assistance to help integrate climate considerations and funding into those agendas and policies, which was really an essential step to enable better planning and budgeting for adaptation and mitigation. So there's gonna be a lot more of this in Glasgow. I'm super excited about it. So please stay tuned. Let me also state though, this year, we launched an Amazon initiative here at the bank, which we mentioned in Barranquilla, that seeks to really forge sustainable development models there based on human capital, natural wealth, cultural heritage of, of this irreplaceable part of the, of the planet, which as you know, we all know, contains the largest continuous tropical forest in the world. Just this past week, the Green Climate Fund approved a new $600 million Amazon bioeconomy fund that will be one of the core financing instruments for our initiative. So we're working hand in hand there. And the creation of an Amazon unit that we're working on within the bank and that we are almost ready to launch is also going to help ensure that we meet that financing goals. And we're just not standing still. So we're going to have a lot of further announcements on funding for this and other projects soon. But everything I announced in Barranquilla headed towards a billion is happening. On the road to Glasgow, the IDB has also led a joint effort with all multilateral development banks to really mainstream nature in our operations and strategies and continue bringing the nature and climate agendas closer together. We're going to have news to share on that front as COP as well. I feel like I'm cheating you at a bunch of news, but we should have done this after. But anyway, you're getting some previews here. Moving forward, though, these joint efforts are going to be key for all of the MDBs to really further develop projects, business models, financing instruments, and help reverse the drivers of nature loss and promote protection, restoration, and sustainable use of nature and its services. The United Kingdom has inspired this line of work, and we're really grateful for our close cooperation ac across the whole gamut of initiatives leading to the summit. We're also going to be unveiling a new climate microfinance initiative that's going to be a regional first. We're excited about that. We're really pushing the envelope here. I mean, obviously, on our financing, on improving our internal structure to prioritize and break down barriers uh, for climate, increase our engagements, external partnerships, make meaningful commitments. And these announcements are just going to be some of the ways that the bank has redoubled its work on climate change since I came to office on October 1st of last year. And I think, look, it's starting to show results. Behind each of these announcements, there's a deep pipeline of related projects across all of our country's sectors. And we're going to forge progress in areas as different as, for example, the blue economy in the Caribbean, which is also very exciting, and electromobility in the Southern Cone. So lots going on there and, uh, and really looking uh, uh, forward to that. But now I get to flip the script. Now I'm gonna put the pressure on you, Annie. So I get to ask you some questions and I'm gonna start with one. You know, look, from your perspective, because I need to learn from you here, this is a, a, a mutual exercise. From your perspective as the head of one of the world's premier think tanks in this field, I wanna know what we should learn. What do you think Latin America and the Caribbean stands to gain or lose from COP? Give us some good advice. First of all, Mauricio, it's, it's very exciting to hear about all your announcements. I, I, I wait to hear the surprising one that you're going to have in uh, COP. I'll be there cheering you on. Look, I, I, I think um, this COP is special for a few reasons. Uh, one is, this is a moment of solidarity. Last two years has been really hard for everyone concerned. Uh, by disease, by economy, what's happening on multilateralism. This is a moment for countries to come, come together 150 heads of states will be there, Mauricio. So Latin America and Caribbean region connecting with each other and the, and the global um, order is very important. Second, you already mentioned this is a comp that comes after a devastation of our economies across the world. So your focus on uh, Vision 2025, connecting uh, good jobs with green economy and recovery is exactly going to be a topic. So one thing we will see a lot out of coming out of the COP is how can countries recover? 
But finally, the most important issue I think that uh, that Latin America and region can get is exactly what you talked about in financing. You know, the pandemic and the economic crisis, this is all connected. Our research is showing nature-based solution can be better for economy, creating more jobs, and in the right places. You know, we already discussed climate benefit of the solution can provide. And we want to make sure getting sufficient funding flow to this project. And I think this is where IDB can be critical in, in actually how the re region uh, recovers. You know, COP serves as a, as a critical platform for resources for Latin America and Caribbean for the pursuit of green recovery. And the magnitude of the finance is what needs to really scale. You know, this has been a really a test case uh, for the global um, leaders here. The OECD report estimates uh, about $79.6 billion would be assigned uh, for uh, from the north to south. This was agreed, the $100 billion per year was agreed in 2009. We think it'll get there. Um, but what we also think that this number, 100 billion per year, needs to be near 400, 500 billion for global South countries by 2324. That's what our research is showing. So the question is, will we get to that ambition? I think that IDB committing 5 billion in climate, this is you know music to my head. This is absolutely fantastic. This will help countries and, and countries will go to get to the 500 billion that is required for the recovery. This, this growing part of uh, uh, sorry, public climate finance is critical for achieving scale. And I just want to point out scale here is the question. And to be honest with you, we don't see yet, and this is why what, I, what you said earlier was so important, only 3% of climate finance is use, uh, uses nature-based solution for climate mitigation, and 1.5% uses nature-based solution for adaptation. This needs to change to get to the recovery we want the growth we want and the climate um, um, reduction we want. So that's where we are, Maurice. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, Andy. And, and I, I got to say, though, you know, I always look at things with the glass half full. And 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 you even hear from the private sector; they're looking more. They're looking for green solutions, green strategies. So we, I think, thanks to leadership like 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 institutes like yours and yours personally, like we're really. I think we've come a long way. And 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 obviously, a lot more needs to be done. But let's let's feed off that momentum. And and look, you mentioned funding. You mentioned financing. That's the main issue. However, back to the point that we were saying before, here in Latin America and the Caribbean. You know, this imperative comes at a time of historic debt burdens, and, and there's been a great deal of focus on finding new sources of financing and innovative financial tools. So I'd love to describe what we're doing here at the IDB, and I think that I'm picking up on that momentum I was talking about. But first, from your perspective, I want to learn what do you see as the most promising approaches to financing climate action, particularly in light of the global economic recovery that we're aiming for? I think, Mauricio, you're absolutely right. I mean, different finances have to align. I think this is the role I think you're playing, right? You're bringing public finance, private finance together. From our research, what we see is the game changer that even two years back you wouldn't have talked about is actually flow of private finance into development, in, into um, uh, climate solution, into nature-based solution. You know, this is, I think this is a really different moment. Um, and we are seeing growing number of private sector companies committing to and not just climate, but nature as well. Last year, institutional investor announced over 100 billion for nature, fueling a growing market for environmental sustainable uh, investments. You talked about carbon market, which is an incredible uh, excitement there. If that starts working and, and, and that market starts working, we will see more uh, private sector uh, money flowing because of a functioning carbon market. But I must point out that despite these commitments, the money from private sector is not yet flowing. So there is commitment and actual flow to investment. And the, and the barrier to that is, is worthy green economic packages that prioritize NBA. So actual investmentable project, which is what I think that, that you are focusing on. And I'd like to hear a lot about that. But our research is showing there's a number of ways private um, sector can mobilize to NBS and a lot of positive things. You know, green bonds for green infrastructure, insurance policy for coral reefs, blended finance packages that allow hard-nosed investors to fetch their target returns on nature investment. The more engagement of investor and NBS is needed so that these models of financial innovation, which is absolutely happening, that can be replicated and scale in all over Latin America and Caribbean. But Mauricio, going back to, there are a lot of things IDB is doing on this area. I just want to make sure our audience hear the exciting approach in financing that you're, you're uh, pushing forward in IDB. Mauricio, back to you. 
I thought you'd never ask, and I led you with the previous question, so I'm glad you asked. Look, we know that business as usual, and I agree with you, is simply not working. So whether on climate change or efforts to realize economic growth, that status quo is not cutting. So that means that we have to not only sharpen our focus on results, but we need to do it. And that's what Vision 2025 is about. And we need to think outside the box, innovate in terms of the financial tools, it's key, and the approaches to private sector mobilization, which is going to be at the heart of it. So let me tell you about some of the things that we're doing. And, and really, I can start making some, some news on this one right now. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, since I teased on the previous, I'm going to give you some stuff right now, some news right now. The IDB and the Rockefeller Foundation, we're launching a new partnership dedicated to eliminating energy poverty. That's going to address climate change and power underserved communities in Latin America and the Caribbean. Specifically, organizations are going to join forces to close last mile gaps in energy access through distributed renewable energy service and thereby support transition towards net zero emission system. And this is going to mark our first collaboration with the philanthropic foundation in the energy sector. We're going to be working with the Rockefeller Foundation in advance of Glasgow in the hopes of having more news then as well. As I mentioned earlier, we're delighted that the Green Climate Fund's new $600 million bioeconomy program is going to help us invigorate sustainable development through our Amazon initiative. And also last week, the IDB board approved a loan and grant to Peru to create a special purpose vehicle to direct funding through financial institutions for bioeconomy businesses that are going to restore, preserve ecosystems, support climate positive investments. This is the first of its kind blended finance model that we hope to attract significant private investment to small businesses and large enterprises that are going to be tackling the joint climate and nature crisis together. So you see, we've been busy in this regards and, and, and I've gotten a, a, a lot, but there's, but, but I haven't even gotten another one that I'm really, really proud of. And I'm really, I think this is going to be game changing. Last month, we announced a groundbreaking natural capital asset class, a whole new class, natural asset class, NACS. They're going to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Our innovation incubator, IDB Lab, worked with a company called Intrinsic Exchange Group from the very beginning of this when they came to us with this radical idea that I think is going to change the way that we do business on this. Fast forward. Today, we have the birth of natural asset companies, these NACs, and they're sustainable enterprises that are going to hold the rights to ecosystem services produced by natural working or hybrid lands. Now, leveraging the power of the market, now the market to, to therefore countries, companies alike, can be compensated through these for their nature positive management. And through an IDB project, Costa Rica is going to be the first country to offer its natural capital in this new exchange. So let me share some some, some facts about a few other innovations in this regard, including uh, of how we uh, crowd in, uh, as we call it, private financing. The IDB as well has pioneered green bond market in our region, which has doubled in two years, obviously far short of the potential. And alongside our private sector arm, IDB Invest, we launched what was called a green bond transparency platform, which is a digital tool that's going to boost invent investor confidence to be able to allow them to follow the entire chain of these uh, green projects. This year, the bank also assembled the largest ever coalition of private sector partners comprising some of the world's biggest, most influential companies. And that coalition has more than tripled in size. And some of the topics that companies have expressed interest in working with us include electromobility, sustainable tourism, green hydrogen, accelerated decarbonization. These are priorities. Like So this, they're coming to us with this. In parallel to that, we're developing debt for nature products. And, our, and, our, and we're designing now in an advanced stage of some more that nature bonds that's going to generate significant funding for marine protection, resilience, and other priorities uh, for some for another one of our member countries. Also, we're looking at risk sharing mechanisms, developing technology platforms to facilitate connections between investors, for example, like BlackRock and others with projects on the ground that are seeking financing. We need to do that matchmaking. So you see, we're mustering all of its lending, our lending, mobilizing my technical expertise. And more than ever at this point to really try to break paradigms in this regard. So uh, I, I hope uh, uh, I, I hope we do you proud, Mauricio. It's I. First of all, you've been busy. But yeah. I've liked the, <laughs> what is I think I and my, the audiences would like is how you're trying to use the forces of market towards yeah. nature. There's the this companies that have been launched the the using using the stock market. This is really innovative, cutting it. So. Okay. Speaking of um, new financial tools and approaches, this event, in a few minutes, our audience will hear about the launch of the series um, of, of, that WRI and IDB has produced together on Nature Based Solutions for the LAC region, right? It finds that the full potential of Nature Based Solutions remains unrealized due to lack of fully financed project. So what, given this deep engagement of IDB, what do you think will take to scale Nature Based Solutions in the region to meet the urgent climate and development needs to be faced you know also the recovery of pandemic that we face yeah 
Look, I think that the report series that we're going to launch today makes clear that nature has to be at the center of our collective response to climate change and that a green recovery uh, has to be at the center of it. And I'm pleased that nature is going to be one of the main themes as, at this year's COPs. Nature-based solutions can account for a full 40% of the reductions in carbon emissions that are needed to limit global warming to less than two degrees Celsius by 2030. Now, we all know that nature is also a vital global asset and all economic activities depend directly or indirectly on the services that nature provides from raw materials to pollination. So let me just give you a, a fact that we should you know, share far and wide and repeat over and over as we work toward so social and economic recovery in Latin America and the Caribbean. Nature-based investments create nearly 40 jobs for every million dollars invested. That's more than 10 times better than for investment in fossil fuels. 10 times better than for investment in fossil fuels. So now when you combine that with job creating potential, bio business, really nature should really be considered an employment powerhouse, a powerhouse. And that ought to inspire public and private investment. And that couldn't be truer than in Latin America and the Caribbean, which is home to 40% of the world's biodiversity, more than 30% of the planet's fresh water, and almost half of its tropical forests. At the same time, of course, the world is witnessing an unprecedented and, and really in the end, highly self-destructive level of biodiversity loss today. So it's kind of counterproductive. And these facts underpin our ambitions to really develop, for example, the Amazon sustainable bioeconomy, as I mentioned before, the new natural capital asset class, the NACs that I described, uh, which we're really proud of, and the collective MDB commitment to, to, to nature as a whole that we're leading ahead of the comp. Now, what we all need is a shift in perspective, a profound realization that nature is an incredible asset and not simply a cost for conservation, not a zero sum game. That shift in perspective for countries, engineers, financial sector, development banks, it's really the first thing needed to scale nature based solutions. And I should mention that IDB was an early leader in the natural, in the natural capital space. France, the UK have generously funded the bank's natural capital lab, which really works across the IDB to support our clients in this area and attract private financing to the natural uh, climate nexus in, in that regards. And, and that includes working to integrate nature-based solutions into our country strategy processes from the start. Just over the five, first, uh, last five years, our infrastructure sector and our climate change sustainable development sector invested in 28 projects with MBS components, totaling over $800 million in financing. We've also championed innovative blended financing instruments that are supported by the Natural Capital Lab. Yet, despite all that, the fact remains that while many MBS projects are being implemented in Latin America and the Caribbean, they're still seeking funding needed in order to be able to scale up operations and achieve envisioned benefits. That said, although infrastructure service providers and private companies really stand to benefit from these nature-based solutions, only a minority of projects in our region have secured funding or participation from those entities. So we have to change that narrative. Governments, infrastructure service providers, investors, they need to step up their committed and really their commitment in this regards, along with us and us being catalyzers and unlock investment for these projects, which I'm sure that we're going to discuss as part of the panel in today's event. The reports that we're launching today will show how we make this happen in Latin America and the Caribbean to create jobs, to support climate goals, and to protect and restore nature. So again, Thank you to WRI. I really commend our teams, our WRI and, and IDB teams, really who worked on this report. Uh, uh, and, and once again, thank you, Ani, for our discussion, for, for the ability to collaborate uh, means the world to us. Thank you, Mauricio.